Jones, Roger Orker, Mike Trish, uh, with Simon Davis, who sat over there, who did a lot of survey work with us at the beginning, uh, at the north end of Rone, we, we've come off our boat, which I'll show you in a minute, which is uh, just about from where I've taken this picture. And in the distance here, uh, is there a point of thing? Okay, yeah, that island there is certainly one of the more interesting things we found. It's a tidal island, very close to half decent um, land on the shore where these buildings on the top of it could so easily have been built. But for some reason in the distant past, people decided to build on this island. And it's one of many things we found of some interest, in, which I'm going to show you this evening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the idea for this talk started when this is Roger and I at uh, a little uh, farmstead called Bula Arsh um, out near South Lee. Uh, you could just see Loch Maddy up there in the distance, uh, which Roger found uh, quite a few years ago now. And we both just had COVID and decided to walk out here for the day. And we were sat here among the ruins having our lunch. Uh, with our two dogs with us and just talking about what we might do next in terms of field survey and really we couldn't really think of anything else on North Hills that we could do and we kind of left it like that but in my mind I had the thought well maybe and we hadn't thought about moving away at this time I might just write a little sort of memoir of all the things we have done just so that we can keep it sort of fresh in our memories and I'm just, this is a brief summary of what I'm going to talk about. So in the initial days, uh, this is when Gina and I lived at Homore. We did, I did some, just started having a look around Homore and finding a few things. And then 2000, 2014 was quite a momentous year because there were three uh, visits, three series of training events on the island, um, which really kicked us all off. I met Roger and Simon for the first time, and that really started the whole thing going. And then after that, for the next uh, three years or so, Simon, Roger and I did these systematic field surveys of three areas on North US, ALL, Rona and the Lees. And we worked under that name, the name at the time of US Summer Wine. Uh, we made several publications. And then after that, uh, Roger and I did a Lost Township survey. And then COVID hit, which meant that it was more difficult to work together. We had all the situation. So I wrote a book about the thatched houses of North US based on the work, the survey work mostly were done already. And then my last work has been to bring everything together really right back from the beginning, because the sheilings of North US, of which there are many, we've been surveying steadily over the years, and I wrote a summary of that too. And then down the bottom, I said there are bits and pieces in between where I went to all kinds of other places uh, as the opportunity arose. So as I said, in the beginning, when we first moved to Home Moor, um, I did some basic survey work. I had very little understanding about what I was doing, but this would be a typical walk for me. You can see this is Lock Skipport. The red line shows my walk route. And I know Simon has done a lot of survey work out here since this, but I just wandered out there looking at some of the old buildings, wondering what they all were, what date they were, because I knew nothing of North Hewitt's history at the time, and ended up on, out on Ornish Point here, where I found this uh, little farmstead um, I had no survey tools with me at all. I had a notebook and a pencil, and literally because of my architectural background, I just pasted this building out um, and took a few photographs. And when I got back home, I made this little sketch, and that was really the extent of my skills. I had no idea when it was built, why it was there, what the people who lived there did, or anything like that. And these were things that I was to learn as the years went by. And then this is where my interest with shielings started. Uh, and this is a valley, which we all probably know, but probably don't know the name of, um, which comes up from the road to South Uist. And this is the summit of Ben Moore along here. 
So if you look out uh, eastwards from the road, you can see some bright green mounds set about a kilometre back from the road. And, uh, and this is a set of sheilings. I didn't really know what those were at the time. And uh, I just walked out there and had a look at them. And this is a picture, in fact, I took uh, last year uh, of Avangetri. Um, and you can just see the sheeting mounds here. And at the time, I was still pacing things out with um, uh, just because I know my pace if I step in a particular way is about a meter long and doing these sketches uh, of the various things I found. But again, not really understanding what this was all about. And then out of the blue, I got a phone call one day from somebody at the Royal Commission saying, oh, we're coming out to do some survey work at the back of Eavel, sorry, not Eavel, then more at Ushinish. And we wondered if you could help us organize some transport for all our survey gear. Well, it turned out this person was George Geddes, who I think most of us know, whom I got to know really well and had been my kind of uh, mentor over the years. And uh, anyway, I wasn't, I was suggested to him he'd get in touch with Nick Inwood, but Nick wasn't able to do it. In fact, the Storish uh, helped him in the end with their, one of their ATV vehicles. Um, anyway, he said, well, if you're in the area, as you are, <laughs> uh, come out and see us at work. So I managed to persuade um, Lee, the late Lee Harrison, which is unfortunately that's him there, to take his little fishing boat out of um, Loch Einort and went out there. This is Ian Stephen Morrison, who was then the editor of our paper. And this is Catherine Newson. And he took us out there. He was doing some crab fishing at the same time. He dropped us off and we went up to Wishnish to see the surveyors at work. Um, I can't remember who they all were now. I think Alex Hale might have been there as well. But this is them surveying a new, in fact, wheelhouse they found, which hadn't been recognised before. Later in the summer, uh, we were talking to our friends, um, Jane and Eric Twells, and they said, oh, well, let's go out there again, because we like going out there and having a look. And we've been inside the suit range there before. And so this is Jane and Eric. Later in the summer, we went out. Jane's sitting on the so-called throne book. Oh, uh, sorry, thrown um, in one of the souterrains. And this is Eric crawling out of one of the souterrains in one of the wheelhouses, which is really difficult and quite scary to get in and out of. Anyway, that sort of really get, got my interest going, thinking, oh, this is really interesting, this stuff. And um, yeah, so that was the end of 2013. So in 2014, as I said, there were this sort of rush of training events to do with archaeology uh, on Hewist. And it's um, and right at the beginning of the year, I'm just going to put this in here. Uh, we bought a boat, uh, this is for our family use, but it turned out to be one of the most useful surveying tools that one could have if you're working on the east side of any part of US, because it gives you very quick and easy access to some really remote places. And I'm sure many of us have walked out there and you know how difficult it is. So instead of having to spend a day walking, overnighting and surveying and all that kind of thing, we're able to nip around in the boat, go ashore and do some work and then come back in the evening. And then at the beginning of 2014, Becky Rennell, uh, who is a tutor here, um, ran a, an evening class of 10 sessions uh, about US archaeology. Um, and as I said, this is where I met Simon and Roger for the first time. And at the end of the, we learned all about different aspects of US archaeology. And also uh, some of the weekends we went out on field walks where we would wander out to a different part of US and have a look at different things. And we started to understand how to recognize things in the environment and actually survey them. And at the end of the course, we had to prepare a project. And this is mine, where I was looking at satellite imagery to find out if you could see other things in the landscape that hadn't been already recorded. So in this picture here, the already recorded items are the red dots and the green things are the things that I spotted. Anyway, I did a test on one of these, which is that little green dot there, because we live just over here in this place here. So I took the boat over, uh, rowed ashore and went and had a look at this. And sure enough, in the middle of a rather sort of uh, bland piece of moor, found a sheathing hut, just a very simple turf structure. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. So we could really add to the uh, sort of understanding of settlement uh, in this part, in the Trabot part of Lewis, and by doing this kind of work. The next set of people to come were from the Glasgow School of Art, and they uh, ran a photogrammetry course. 
So this involves taking multiple pictures of buildings or sites or whatever. Um, and this, in fact, this is where we're all here at the Crimson Wheelhouse. And this is the actual 3D model that we, we managed to, um, sorry, that Stuart Jeffrey, who was leading the course, was able to produce overnight for us. And thereafter, this is Simon here at a site on Rone, and me, I'm not sure where, and we bought these little cameras that we put on top of poles to get better aerial pictures of sites. And this became a really important tool in our survey work after that. So I know it's a case of probably mine's bigger than yours, but Simon was actually, I think at that time, time using a walking stick with an ant on the top. Okay. <laughs> 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 the occupied front of him, so I was going to see Okay, this is me with a much bigger pole. This is a six meter length of waist height that I bought from Cali Timber. <laughs> and you can see, and this is just an ordinary camera actually just strung on a piece of spring at the top that was taking pictures every few seconds or something. So it was all very crude at the time, but we were able to start to understand how we could use this technique to produce very quick renditions of sites that didn't involve a lot of measuring um, and, you know, the sort of standard method of scanning. And then not long after that, uh, the um, Joe Hambly and Eddie Graham who work at St Andrews University uh, through the SCAPE organisation, uh, came over to train us in what was then called the, the sort of Scottish Coastal Heritage Herit 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 uh, Risk Project. That's right, Heritage Risk Project. And this is us up at Val Ranald learning how to survey. Oh, done it again. So I'll take it. Sorry, take it. Uh, uh, this is us at Val Ranald um, being shown, I think it's Joe here, explaining how to look at sites and how to record them. And they had a little phone app actually that you could use to record. This is um, the map today of the uh, number of sites. You can see there are different colors. The red ones were of particular interest, but many of these sites out here are ones that we recorded because they were unable to, the original surveyors, were una unable to go more than I think it was a couple of miles from the road or something for some kind of health and safety reason. Mm -hmm. And then with Simon and Roger, I went out to this site at Ragashnish, the Seatmore Cairn, which is a coastal, the remains of a, I think it's a chambered cairn that lies actually now below the high water mark. And uh, this was our first attempt really at using photogrammetry, which we'd learned a few weeks before to record um, you know, a coastal site and then put a new record into the uh, sharp record. So this is us over this period of time learning about how to do this properly and having really good um, tutors in the process. So I think we came out of it a lot, a lot better uh, prepared to do the work that we were about to start. In, I think it was in October or maybe September, Roger and his wife had just come back from Trish I had this very garbled phone call from him saying, David, I'm on Balashare and we just found this very odd thing in the mud here. Can you come over? Well, I couldn't. And I said, well, what have you, what is it you found? He said, I don't know, it's something very odd, uh, but I think somebody should come and have a look at it. So I phoned up Kate McDonald, um, who's an archeologist living on South Uris and asked her what to do. And she said she'd phone the county archeologist. Anyway, we all agreed to go up in the following morning to have a look at this thing. And basically what Roger had found was this extraordinary small, what looked a bit like a basket, which was about maybe that big by that big, so not very big at all. And in it was this collection of bones and these quartz flakes. And it appeared to lie in a kind of cradle of bracken. We think, I think it was bracken and it's clearly very old. I won't go into what happened afterwards because some archaeologists came and took it away a few days later and they basically said it was not very interesting at all. Clearly it was very interesting. Uh, Roger had carefully taken out the bones on the day he found it because the tide was coming in over this every 12 hours. He felt the bones, and you could see one on the top there just lying loose, would just get washed away. So he collected all the bones together and took them home and photographed them as you can see there. Um, we gave them to the archaeologist who probably lost them. In fact, there was an inquiry came back from two years ago saying, uh, do you have to know where the dog bones are? And Roger said, no, we gave them to you and put them on the dashboard of your van. <laughs> so clearly they probably chucked them out. 
thinking they were somebody's lunch or something. Anyway, uh, Kate reckoned that these are the bones of a small puppy or a, a small dog of some kind. And obviously somebody in quite a long time ago, because this is well below the sand level, had made this little nest and put this poor, obviously dead dog in, added a few quartz pebbles, which make it look interesting. And that was a live, a little burial. And this is very close to the Iron Age wheelhouses there. So we assume that this could well be linked to some settlement around that area at that time. Um, when I was doing my um, project for the, um, the course with Becky Reynolds, I'd also looked at this area of Eyreval, and in the autumn, um, I suggested to Roger and Simon that we ask Nick to take us out in his boat into this area here so that we can have a look around these possible settlements. So none of these have been recorded. This is just what you can see on satellite imagery. <clears throat> so the blue line is the route of the boat, and that's how it will be from now on. And the red line is, is where we walked. And so we went ashore and started looking at some things. And then Nick said, I'm just going up this rocky knoll and I'm going to see if I can see any sea eagles. So he went, and anyway, about five minutes later, he came back clutching his digital camera and he said, have you ever seen anything like that? And in this, in his, in his, on his camera were these extraordinary pictures of these remains up on this hilltop. Um, and we were just stunned. We couldn't really understand what he had seen. So we all rushed up the hill, and these are three of the structures. This is the uh, next boat, by the way, tied up that day when we went ashore. So the bottom left is a passageway that's below ground level, and you can see the sort of lintels or roof that was over it had tumbled in. Uh, the bottom right is this wonderful uh, corbelled stone cellular structure, which is probably no bigger than a couple of meters across. And you can see it actually curves over and very well preserved. And then literally in amongst the heather, we saw this um, quernstone here with its rubber in place. Uh, and it was just like, it was like a Marie Celeste moment is the only way I can describe it. It was just extraordinary. Your heart sort of was beating. It, and you just think, what have we stumbled across here? It just seems to be so extraordinarily complicated, but there's such a lot here. And anyway, we were quite sort of blown away by that. Anyway, because of the tide, we had to get back in the boat and go home. And anyway, we resolved to go back the next week when there was a more favorable tide and do some recording. This time we went with um, Alistair Croish Morag, MacDonald, who you see here. This is actually the site on the top of this hill in the background. Nick Ingledew, Simon, Roger, uh, and, um, and we did a basic survey using our three-dimensional camera technique and I came home and with my sort of leftover architectural skills, I did these basic drawings. And you can see it's a really quite a complex set of structures, all jumbled together. There's pits, there's passageways, there's underground cells, there's, the, there's above ground cells, there's all kinds of things on this rocky knoll. But what we did just notice down one side, and you can just see it there, was a bit of a wall. And the only thing we could think was that it was some kind of defensive site because it was up high, it was quite difficult to get up to, um, but we had no more idea than that. Anyway, we did a bit of recording and sent it all off to uh, the Royal Commission, to George Geddes actually, and asked him what he thought. And um, anyway, that then moved on to the next year. So in 2015, we set about doing some systematic survey work out on Eyreval. And this again is a typical route. We did this before our boat was back in the water, so it'd be in the late winter, early spring. So Simon, Roger and I walked along this red route out to Leonish Peninsula. Um, and this is a typical set of finds that we would make in a day. None of it recorded, it's just all lying out there. So on the top, you see Roger and Simon standing by what is clearly the remains of a house of some kind. Bottom left, uh, up from the seashore, are these cleared areas, which are uh, boat landing places. Um, this structure here, we found several of these. They look like jetties, but they're always at the high water mark. And we think afterwards they're probably where seaweed was hauled out and dried. 
And then these funny structures are all over the place around the coast there, which are, I think, known colloquially in Simon as sailors' graves. That's what we thought they might be. But in fact, we worked out subsequently, Simon found a paper on this topic somewhere, and it turned out that they were um, probably the remains of kelp kilns, where people were burning kelp. So they're not very far from the shore. Um, and if they were sailors' graves, there's an awful lot of dead sailors, that's all I can say, out on the shores. Uh, this is a plan of Leonish, which I drew afterwards. The house I was just showing you, sorry, I've done it again, uh, is that one there. Um, this is a particularly interesting site that we ended up at the end of that day. Um, and if you look at this plan here, you can see that what we've got is a kind of a small rocky knoll which had the remains of a wall around it. We've got this oval circular structure, which is part turf, part stone. And in the middle, this two compartment house, which is, we didn't know at the time, but we do now. This is a very, very unusual thatched house structure on Hewis, because to have two, uh, a two compartment house uh, connected by a passageway is very unusual. And in fact, the, the closest comparison we could find was this building here, which is one of the Norse houses. I think it's one of the ones at Bornish, or is it the Kilfeda one? Can anyone help me there? It was anyway, a better one. This, Kill is better. A, um, this is in fact a Norse period house where it has a secondary structure connected by a passageway. And we thought there were real similarities between these two. And basically, we don't know any more than that. Um, again, that's been recorded, but no one's really um, been back there. Uh, the top left is a photogrammetry view of the, these two structures connected by the passage. And this is a photograph, I think, from just last year, an aerial photograph showing how it is on the ground. So this is the Rocky Knoll. This is the two buildings connected by the passage. And this is the uh, circular structure. Some rabbits have been in that. Um, you know, there was the usual midden material coming out. I think there was some shells, bits of pottery, that kind of thing. So again, that could be quite old. And then we decided to go back to Bay Morag again. And this time we invited a whole load of people. I don't know if anybody else, anyone who's here who's there, um, but certainly Ellie and Joe from Skate came that day. Kate McDonald was there, I remember. Uh, Catherine uh, McLeod was there. And you may see a few people. Anyway, because of the tide, we couldn't go into Bay Morag itself, Pamoyak, where we had to land by the old inn at Polnangal. Um, so you can see our red route. We never did a circuit around this lock um, and back to the fort, where, as we now thought it was, which is the, the main Bay Morag site, which is just there. And here is some of those people standing at one of the farmsteads that we had previously located. That's definitely Kate McDonald with her back to us. And I think Joe Hamley is in there too. I'm not sure who the other people there. So top left picture is the plan of the old inn, which is a very interesting building and still to this day, not shown on any Ordnance Survey map, quite how it's lasted that long and never been recorded, we don't know. Bottom left is the farmstead that this group of people are standing at, which is just close to the, the fort site. And bottom right is a wonderful uh, one of two rock shelters that I found just as we were going back to the boat and we were being called to go and uh, we had to go back. But um, this is a wonderful rock shelter that's got walling around it and got shells on the floor inside. So that's again, probably quite old. On the way around the lock, we went to the houses on the top right, which were believed to be lived in by John McCodrum, a famous North US bard. And if that's correct, they are dated to about 1770 quite accurately, because he's known to have moved there then. Um, top left is the dune in Loch uh, Kirish. Um, and this is me going out there with my waders on along a very, very difficult causeway, quite scary uh, to go and record that. And then bottom left is something a bit more interesting because Simon went ahead of us after we'd been round the lock and walked up to, and when we got up there, he said, do you know something? I think I found something really interesting here. And in amongst this really knee-high heather, he'd found a very small piece of awning, which you can just see up there by Roger. And anyway, you can see them struggling around and just trying to work out what it is. 
Anyway, over the course of the following summer, Simon and I went out in our boat at least four times. And the top left is how we found it on, how it was recorded on the day that Simon found it. Top, uh, top, sorry, top left, top right is after our first visit to clear all the heather off it. Bottom left is our second visit and bottom right is our third visit. And this is a really important building. It's a new uh, hut circle or roundhouse uh, that the Royal Commission actually came and surveyed later. Anyway, it was another wonderful find that we just, you can see in a course of really six months, we'd found several really important structures that had never been recorded before. And you know, we were really excited that we could carry on like this, that wherever we went, we would get lucky and find something interesting. Of course, life isn't like that. But anyway, we, we lived in hope at that time, certainly. Anyway, another very interesting building. And you can now see this on satellite imagery quite clearly if you look at that uh, area of, uh, of Eobar. We also did some other random survey work. Uh, we did quite a lot of work out at Ushkabar. We did several works, walks out there. Once we walked in from uh, Rueval, we came out in boat several times and looked at various things out there. Uh, this is some of the, this is a top, is a recent uh, drone picture looking out over Loch Ushkava. You can see it's very remote, but in amongst all these islands and inlets, it's a wonderful piece of scenery, if nothing else. Bottom left, we've got probably what's a 1920s department house. In the middle, an earlier house, maybe from late 1700s or something. And bottom right, the, Nun the foundations of the Nunton Hill School, which served this area, and you can see was put there in 1946. That's got a particularly his interesting history you found out afterwards because the school, which was a corrugated iron building, was originally down at Bar Hartaba, right at the south end of South Uist. And after it was here, it was moved to one of the um, crofts on Grimsey. And in fact, when we moved here, you could still see it. It's now been taken down. So that wonderful corrugated iron building had three lives, including this one here in its lifetime. There's some more structures. Again, you can see there's a pier there. The bottom left is a wonderful mooring stone, we think, out at Scarilioth Pier, um, uh, which is you know, a really dramatic structure. Uh, that is Hacker Farmhouse, top right, with some of the older buildings in front of it. And then in the middle at the bottom is the uh, what's known as the Prince's Fold, which is also out on Roshnish. Uh, and you can just see a very faint outline there of this triangular structure in the, in the sort of turf there. Um, and this was discovered by the late Jean-Luc, sorry, Jean Didier Hache, who was a Frenchman who wrote the book about the French MacDonald. Um, and he worked out that this was probably where Bonnie Prince Charlie left for the Isle of Skye in, at the end of his antics on the US. And uh, again, it's, it's a shame, it's not recorded on Canwall, um, but it's there, it's real, and it certainly is a, you know, an interesting building. Sorry, that's that again. Thank you. And then some other random uh, survey visits. I went to Heathersdale on South Uist uh, and just uh, looked around there, recorded a few new buildings. Um, that's another really interesting part of uh, South Uist, which is under-recorded. Found a new rock shelter, you can see bottom left there. And at the top is this quite high level farmstead, which looks down over everything. And quite why it's there, who knows, because most farmsteads are always down at kind of sea level. And then out of the blue, I had a contact from a PhD student at, the, at uh, Aberdeen University called Patricia Kupiak who was doing some research on uh, shielings, and she had done some trial bits on the Kildonan shielings, which you can see are just up behind the museum. You can see them on the hill there. Anyway, in the floor, in the floors of these shielings, she had found layers of sand, and she asked me if I'd walk around Kild uh, Kildonan Loch, Loch Nalum, uh, to see if I could find out where the sand might have come from and send her samples. So that's my walk route, and I was stopping at the beaches on the way to collect sand, which I sent off to her. And of course, those of us who've been involved with the Island of Stone project will know that in fact, this site here, this dune, was in fact one of the two places where when the guys were here this summer, they found Neolithic pottery. 
So, and I didn't know that because we didn't know that at the time at all. It's just like an ordinary island doom. Anyway, around the shore, you can see this is my record of this. I found these small circular huts and various structures, all of completely unknown age or what they were or anything. And uh, so uh, there's a, I think there's a really, really good possibility that some of these structures could be connected because they're not really like shielding huts or any other huts you might find that might be connected with the, uh, what was going on on the dune, perhaps in Neolithic times. So I think this is, you know, 2015, that's quite a long time ago, because you can see I had no idea at all what they were at the time. And then we also decided to uh, do some survey work on the island of Rone, Ronai, which is just off Grimsey, as you all know. And the blue line is the boat that we took in our boats. There's a Roger, Simon and I again. And the red dotted line is the walk we took along uh, Ronai Bakbik, which is the top end of the sort of almost other island off the north end of Rone. And there are two unusual place names here. The bay between Ronai and Ronai Bik is called Ana Uf, which is Bay of the Cave, and the place, uh, you can, can't quite see it, but it's just written there on the Ordnance Survey map, is Bad Foleic, place under the slabs. But there was no record locally in local memory or history of any kind of cave there. In fact, everyone thought this might be a spelling mistake by the Ordnance Survey. It might have been Bay of the Lamb. Um, but anyway, um, this is the walk we did. And at the end of our time there, we ended up at Bad Folek, and there's two farmsteads there. And we started to look around and we found these, at the bottom of this cliff with these two piles of rocks where there'd been some considerable rock fall. And anyway, we looked inside them and you could see that these were um, actually rock shelters. So one of them, the one here on the right, you have to get in through a very small hole inside. And this one here, you have to climb down through the top and literally lower yourself down into it. Um, anyway, absolutely fascinating inside, the usual shells and bits and pieces on the floor. And we obviously believe that these are what is referred to either place under the slabs or the Bay of the Cave, which actually refers to these structures. Um, and Simon noticed, I don't think you can actually quite see it here. I think it's just visible there. That little pile of stones there is actually a bit of walling that had been constructed underneath one of these massive slabs that form the roof um, to sort of keep it propped up. So some of them obviously realized that maybe something was moving and then put this little piece of, like a little plinth in there to keep it upright. Anyway, another, who knows how old that is, when it was used, um, who lived in it, completely unknown. But another very, we thought it was a really, really interesting discovery. So in a kind of way, at this time, our luck was still in. We were still finding good stuff. Simon and I asked if we could go to the Community Heritage Conference, the Scottish one, which was in Pitlochry in 2015, and do a talk. Uh, Roger was away, but he came back, and we met up in Pitlochry, and we gave a talk about our work on Airval, and that was our first sort of public lecture, and we had to sort of sort it all out and start talking about what we were doing and why. And uh, I think it went down reasonably well. We were very naive. We had very little time to do it. But anyway, that seemed to go okay. While we were there, I bumped, I met a chap called Piers Dixon from the Royal Commission, who was then in charge of survey work. And I said to him, do you think some of your surveyors could come out to a US next year and do some work at Bay Mora, where we found what we thought were two really interesting new things. And he said, well, maybe if you can get some money to help with the accommodation and the boat trips, then we might be able to fit it in or something. So anyway, uh, in 2016, um, this is when the Royal Commission came out to um, survey this work. Before that, we continued with our coastal survey work because we promised that Ellie and Joe from Sharp that we would actually continue and do all of the red sites. And this has led to some interesting stuff. Simon's recently been working up at Kildonan on one of what was then one of the red sites that we rather dismissed at the time, but has turned out to be very unusual and interesting. Roger and I went up to Burnaray to check out this one, uh, one winter's day, and we were just looking around the old village of Shabby and walked out to where this dune, there's hardly any of it left now on this offshore island because the tide was out. 
Anyway, when we were walking across to this dune, which is in this location here, we saw this timber in this sort of muddy layer on the beach. And at the time, it all seemed to be aligned in a particular way. We thought we might have found an old trackway that would have connected what <coughs> was possibly the shore with what was then the dune. Anyway, great excitement, lots of photographs, and we thought our luck was in again. Um, anyway, later in the year, the Sharp team came back. So this is Ellie, uh, Graham, and uh, Joe again. And they brought with them, sorry, Jeannie, what's the guy's name? Um, Scott Timpany. Scott Timpany, sorry. Um, Scott Timpany, who's one of uh, Scotland's foremost uh, timber specialists. And uh, he came with them and they took lots of trial samples. And then in the evening, they showed us how to identify timber species using microscopes and sections of one thing or another. And I think, is that Mari McLean, Mari Stewart, or is it Catherine? I think, I think it's Catherine, anyway, bottom right, just looking at a sample and a thing. Anyway, it turned out that we had found something really quite interesting. And I know it's a bit unclear, but what it says is, is that the timber layer was dated to about three and a half thousand BC. So, and Scott reckoned that this is when the terrestrial woodland uh, started to get destroyed by some climate change, sand blowing around, very wet conditions, and um, that kind of thing. And then below that um, is the sort of this table here in the bottom right shows what was going on before that. Anyway, it was a very interesting visit. And again, we learned a lot. I can see Anne just in there <laughs> as well. And then in April, the, the, the Royal Commission did send a team from Edinburgh to come and survey Ben Morag. And here we all are. We, had a, we went out with them and did some walking around while they were measuring. Uh, this is one of the original sketches. Uh, that was prepared while they were actually there. So this is a bottom left as a survey drawing. This is us having our lunch. And this is some of the finished drawings that um, they did when they got back to Edinburgh. And what they decided was, is that the structure up on the rock was a prehistoric fort of some kind. They were able to trace the walls around the edge of the kind of escarpments that surround it. And these things they thought were probably almost certainly souterrains, and but they thought it was a multi-period site anyway. But the main thing was they thought it was very unusual because these walls that ran around the edge of the steep bits definitely made it look like some kind of defensive structure. And they thought it was at least Iron Age, if not a bit earlier. And then on the bottom left is the survey plan of Simon's Wallhouse, um, or sorry, Simon's roundhouse, I should say, they will only describe it as a hut circle, but you can just see uh, just there and there that under the heather and below all the turf and everything that's grown since, there is just a hint that this might be another wheelhouse. So very interesting. Anyway, it's very good to have them here. They gave some lectures while they were here as well. And yeah, and again, we had a really good time with them. Because the boat was paid for on the third day, uh, a group of us, 10 of us, wore, uh, after we dropped off the uh, survey party back at Bay Morag, which was on the Friday, uh, we got Nick to take us up to the base of the Lees. And this is the walk we did that day back to Bula Carrigary. Um, this is us up at Dune Carrigary. You see Simon there again, Roger sitting down. I think that's Anna Welty sitting next door to Roger, who's um, a sort of community archaeologist from the Northwest. And then this is um, Nick Inglejew standing there. This is another one of these Corbel stone huts, uh, which again, we think there are only these two, this one and the one at Bay Morag. And you can just see Nick's boat just tied up to a rock down there, uh, which is how we got in and out. <coughs> These are some of the other things, a very interesting <coughs> machining site, which had not been recorded before. This is the Lees Roundhouse, which we visited, which is uh, another roundhouse. This is a set of probably fishermen's huts down by the shore. And this is just a more detailed picture of the um, Corbel Stone Hut.
si that summer, summer, Simon and I did more survey work on the Lees. We started to work along the north shore of Lockheed Port. And again, you can see the, the boatway in. Down to the left, there's a series of farmhouses through Caithness and uh, Sponish. Um, all very interesting and obviously multi-period sites. And then up in Loch Hunder, I managed to drag my dinghy, my inflatable dinghy, over into the loch and I visited to the two dunes there, which are also very interesting. So the top one is the one that you can walk to from the shore, which is really well preserved and got very thick wall, fairly typical, I think, but well preserved. The one on the bottom left is the one in the middle of the loch, which is, you can just see it's got the remains of this very thick wall around it, most of which has sort of collapsed, but you can just trace, trace it, perhaps it's unfinished. Uh, and then in the middle is this circular structure, almost perfectly circle, and you can see other uh, huts and bits and pieces of structure. There's a cell in the wall there. There's some more stuff outside down here. And uh, so I made a full record of that. And this is the Caithness farmhouse on the right here, bottom right here, which has got the longest thatched house we ever surveyed, which were ever on North Use, which is about 25 meters long. It's absolutely enormous. And these other structures near to it. And the one little thing in the bottom right is probably a corn kiln. Um, that same year, Kurakag, the Botan Botanical Recording Group, made a trip to Helize and I hitched, hitched the lift. And while Simon and his colleagues were looking at all the interesting plants up at the top end, I did this walk and had a walk around there. And a very interesting experience there because I was just walking through this old village that you can just see there. And this boat, I was absolutely on my own in the middle of nowhere, and this boat pulled up and two people got out. Anyway, it turned out that one of their distant neighbors, Barra, or one of their distant relatives lived in this village here. And it turned out he was a shark fisherman, basking shark fisherman in the, in the Victorian times. And um, so this is what this settlement was on this little island off the north end of Barra. And uh, continuing in the Lees um, that summer, I did some survey. We took our boat up to Loch Maddy and kept it on the pontoons there, which produced an interesting result in itself, but I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and I visited Ard Maddy, which you can see on the ferry if you look out to the left when you come in. And then also to Lech Maddy, which is the point there, which has got something slightly relevant to recent events here as well. So, top left is a plan of the Ard Maddy township. Uh, bottom left is a picture of it, and then bottom right is a very unusual building there because it's very well built. Um, it's obviously quite old, but it's built with mortar and four square with fireplaces and this kind of thing. Some local people think it might have been an inn at one time, but there's no real history for it. Perhaps it might have been lived in by, it was built by the estate for a gamekeeper, um, or it might have been a kind of a shop or store of some kind. Anyway, top right is our boat. At, um, in fact, this is Peter Keeler's boat just here, I think. Uh, this is our boat here when the ferry drove into the pontoon. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just see how close it was. So this is the buckled pontoons and we're against the last one that's still level. Anyway, I had this phone call from Peter Keeler, 10 o'clock in the morning saying, um, have you seen the pictures on social media of your boat? And I said, no, I haven't. And he sent it to me and I was going, oh my God, what's happened? <laughs> anyway, he said that he thought everything was okay, but I jumped in the car and dashed up there, but it was okay, but it's obviously all a bit of a disaster. Anyway, you can see they, they obviously got the ferry off at the end, but um, anyway, it was a bit of a, a heart-stopping moment for me, thinking that our boat, and luckily no one else was tied up at the pontoons at the time. And then out on, uh, on Manny Point um, is an old signal station, um, which I knew was there because of this is Ordnance Survey map here, top left from about 1900. So it's before radio, and they'd already laid the telegraph cable into North Uist from uh, Harris. And the way they communicated with naval ships at the time was by using semaphore, and you can see a typical semaphore setup on the top right there, which are these sort of lever arms. It wasn't done with flags, it was done with lever arms. So they would get telegraphed from the Admiralty in London and they would signal, because there was no radio then, they would then signal to the naval ships in the Minch what they wanted the Admiralty to, uh, to hear them. In the ground, I found this piece of cast iron uh, ring here, which obviously supported the base of the semaphore. 
and I managed to record all of that. You can see the plans here. And then in amongst everything, I found this little concrete block top left with this plaque in it, which recorded it as a hydrographic survey station. Didn't know, it couldn't work out what that was because it clearly didn't fit with a semaphore. And anyway, I got in touch with the Admiralty Records Office in Taunton and they said, oh, we don't know, but we think we know a man who does. And it turned out that when the Royal Yacht Britannia started to come up here in the early part of the Queen's reign, everyone was terribly worried that they were going to go aground because they were poor, the charts were very poor and on detail. I'm used to going to Loch Maddy quite a lot, apparently. And anyway, so the Admiralty organized a complete resurvey of this area uh, at, in about 1950 or 60. And these plaques are where the survey uh, equipment was set up and all that. The little, the hut, the now destroyed hut, bottom right, uh, was linked to a Decker station that was based in Loch Maddy. And you can still, still got beds and all kinds of things. People obviously stayed there, cooker, one thing, another. Um, and that's a remnant of another um, sort of period of uh, naval communication now long gone. 2017, we will conti uh, continue the work on Rone. And this is a very interesting site. I was just talking about with someone today at the back of Rone, which is linked to the McDonald's of Waternish. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But there's this wonderful jetty with these flight of steps down and this set of house foundations, uh, which are clearly modern, but nobody, again, knew any history to this. And anyway, it was about this time over a period, over this period that we finished our aerial field survey and we produced our first report. And this is a copy of it here, so it's quite thick, it's quite dull, it's got lots of sort of records and drawings and things in. Um, we didn't really, we weren't really able to do too much else, talk about history or anything, but so that was our, but it contains about, so as you can see, we added 185 new records to what was then a very sparse Canmore entry set of 25. So it was quite a significant achievement. A uh, typical early mistake for people doing this kind of thing. Uh, we forgot a complete section. I did. I forgot to paste it into the final thing that was printed. So a year later, we had to produce an addendum, which included that section and a few other bits and pieces. But sort of, yeah, I didn't feel very happy about that. There was nothing to be done because it had all been printed. And then that year was the, South, the archaeology conference on South Hughes, which uh, Alistair organised. And uh, we'd, Simon and I again did a talk at that for what was quite an esteemed gathering of archaeologists. And I think we felt a bit more confident at that time when we were talking to that group. Uh, this is just a random look up at Ben Briach. We knew there was a cairn up there, but it had got lost. So Roger and I, in the winter of 2017, went back out there in the snow. And anyway, we just had a sort of had a think about where it might be and we found it. You can see Roger top left there standing in the snow. We went back the year, you know, the following summer to record it again. And you can see it's a proper square can with at least two of its corner posts intact and some other um, sort of upright stones as well. And a couple of the side sections as well. I mean, I'm not really an expert on these things, but I think they might be Pictish. I don't know if anybody else knows anything about them, but anyway, and in the, behind and cut into the, or cut into the rock is this wonderful, almost like a sort of sepulchral sort of cave. Um, and who knows what that was, but it's just literally right by the can. And I just put this picture in because every, all the time we're out about wonderful scenery, we're just having these wonderful experiences all the time. 2018, having found that Pictish can, we thought we'd try and find some other sites that were lost. This is one on Eyrval called Uv Kilta. Kilta, is that right? Kilta? Kilta. And this is an underground, um, again, it's a kind of a rock shelter that looks like a hiding place to us. And it's a very difficult entry. We found out where this was by again talking to Alistair MacDonald Kush Morag, who has the grazings here. And he just said, Oh, yeah, I know where that is. You go up from the cave and there's a rocky knoll. And if you go around the side, we had to walk about around this thing about five times before we found this entrance. And again, it's a really tricky entry that you have to drop down into this hole here where it's circled yellow 
And then when you get inside, it's really quite cramped and a bit scary. Uh, but then that was another one found. And then just back to Rone briefly, this is more of this development of Banner Catholic. It was undertaken by this Captain Alan MacDonald from Waternish, um, which is a very interesting set of things. He owned Rone, we found out. And I found out from the MacDonald archive in um, Portree uh, all about his history. And got some photographs you can see in there, top right. This is a more pictures. The Waternish house for the MacDonald's is shown top left. It's sort of built in a Loire chateau style, which I think was quite popular in the early 19th century or maybe late 18th. And believe it or not, in the archive, they have this drawing right hand side, which says sketch plan of cottage for Captain Alan MacDonald of Waternish. And it's almost certainly what he was thinking about building on Rona. So it's absolutely wonderful. I was, it was really, this is very different for us now. We're actually doing research in archives and this kind of thing, and not just going around trying to find stuff and record it, but actually trying to find out what it is, who is related to it. Um, there's also, you can see in the map at the bottom left, an outline of a walled garden, which he's proposing to build. The whole thing's quite extraordinary. And of course, all unfinished. He, we think he probably ran out of money. And in 2018, we published the Rone Field Survey. Um, I'm just going to skip over this one because I'm a bit short of time. Yeah, in the summer of 2018, uh, went out to high school with Nick. And because the tides were right, uh, our younger son, Joe, and I, we walked right out onto Ken Ia. Um, and right on the coast there, we found um, it was foggy, which is quite unnerving, actually, because you couldn't see one island from the other when we were walking back. You all sort of felt the tide might come in. Um, is a wonderful big shell midden. Um, and I know that people are always looking for them to, because these are often signs of really early settlement. And in amongst, you can see top right there, limpet shells, and it's a really, really big mound. Bottom left, you can see the mound itself. And also bits of pottery, and what to me looks like a bit like a winkle picker, where people would use that to get the, the, um, the flesh out of different kinds of shells. Um, yes, and then in 2018, Tertia Barnett came to um, Uist to um, start the uh, Scotland's, sorry, rock, art, rock art project, sorry, and I took her out to Hatlet to see the wonderful um, uh, stone there. Roger Simon and I had been out there at least once before. And there was this fantastic carved stone, which I think was used as a piggery when it was first recorded underneath it. It's got, you can see, cut marks and this circular uh, mark, and also a couple of initials, which I've been able to find out was probably some people who lived there in the sort of turn of the 19th, 18th, sorry, the 20th century. And this is their old view bottom right of it. Uh, Roger and I then publish these sites that we found and include, you can see the Cairn there top right, and we put this into Discovery and Excavation Scotland uh, in the autumn of 2018. 2019 was the start of the age of the drone, so we've been using these cameras up until then, but then the, these very um, technical drones, very clever drones, became available where you could fly and take pictures without really having to uh, worry too much about where they were or the wind or anything. The top left hand one is a by first one, which was very, very difficult to control, but you could get some pictures from it. But these two bottom right are the latest ones, which are very, very good at taking aerial pictures and make surveying even easier. And it was about the time that Roger got his that we did this walk one winter's day out at Arvor, uh, which is on the north end of North Uist. And we thought this was really interesting because on satellite imagery, you can see this amazing circular enclosure, which is, a, which is at least two or 300 meters across. And then across the top of it, you can see the modern croft division. And in each of these uh, croft divisions is uh, a farmstead. So you can see they're rather similar and there's another one out here on that point there. And then there's another one there. So we got started to thinking that we could tell, we could find out from these things what had happened in this transition between 
when the crofts were set up in about 1800 or 1820 or something like that. And underneath these lines of the modern crofts, you could see what was going on beforehand if you thought about it. So we started what we called a Lost Villages project from this. And this is a drawing of our ore, and you can see up there, this is the ring ditch or bank. And there's another little structure, sort of standing stones inside uh, and all the props. And so it's very, um, yeah, it gave us the idea to develop this idea. We also had access to this 1799 map of North Use by Robert Reed, which is really interesting. Um, and a lot of information on it about what was going on at the turn of the 19th century. And I've just enlarged the Ard Maddy uh, section there, and you can see he drew on the little houses. They're not necessarily accurate in terms of orientation, but we think the numbers are right. And these are the villages we selected. And I'll just quickly go through some of the pictures. This is Clacken Shando, which is just up near the turning down to Clacken Shando. And this is an aerial picture again using a drone now showing these old houses, which are all probably late 18th century in date, if not earlier. So these predate the crofting period. And then wonderful Foshgari, which I expect quite a few people know. And again, we're using aerial pictures here, aerial drone pictures to draw out sites and pull out. This is a particularly interesting site because there are wheel houses underneath the upper, upper houses here. So this is, you can just see I've sketched them out there, what beverage excavated in about 1918, 19. So it's and this is Illaray, which is another extremely well-preserved um, bale um, and very well worth going to have a look at. It's very easy walk from road. If you want to get a feel for how people were living in what kind of communities and the structures they were living in before uh, people lived in their individual crofts. And finally, Penmore, uh, which is a kind of lost village up near Balranald. You can see Balranald House there, just on the horizon. Um, again, an, an aerial picture. And you can see it was shown by Reed and is recorded in a few tenancy agreements. And there's just a few houses, a few remains there, which uh, were completely lost, in fact. So we were quite pleased to be able to do that. And this is our publication, uh, which we uh, didn't get around to because of COVID and everything didn't get around to printing out until 2021. And then 19, we then published the Leesfield survey. 2020 was COVID. Uh, we couldn't go out together. We had to, you know, we had all those restrictions, you remember. Uh, I decided to, on my own, survey a whole series of huts that had been re partly recorded up in this Northwest part of North US between Hoster and Skullpeg. And that was uh, produced hundreds and hundreds of huts in these very unusual patterns, all different forms. And I recorded all those. And this is another aerial picture taken with drones of, I won't go into too much detail because I'm running out of time, but there's a couple of the huts there bottom left, but odd field system up there, which is up on the moor. What's that all about? Huts scattered all amongst this. Um, no real understanding of what that's all about. It may have just been connected to sand blow and the townships below near the coast having all their arable land taken away. So people maybe just set up fields up on the top and you can see bits of cultivation there. Um, and during COVID, I reassembled all of the information I had about thatched houses because I was quite interested in that topic being a retired architect and wrote a book about those. And this is an early sketch of when I went to Tyree many, many years ago when I was working as an architect. I did a sketch of a thatched house there. This is it today, middle. And anyway, these are all the sites on the North Hills of the thatched houses I recorded. This is a selection of them. I wrote a book about that. And here's some of the examples. So top left is Grimsey Wheelhouse. Attached to it is probably one of the earliest thatched houses I've used, carefully um, sorted out by Alistair McKenzie, who's sitting here just to my left. He kindly took me out there and showed me it all. Uh, Drimna Jerag on the right here, which is Ian Armit's excavation, another one. Bottom left is Ewan McDonald's house on the ballet, which I think is dated quite accurately to about 1720, but was almost certainly thatched when it was first built. And bottom right there, just a random house on Rone. And this is a crofting township with thatched houses in up at um, uh, Grenitote, 
Again, it's well preserved because the, it was cleared about 20 years after it was set up. Uh, and then when they re-established Granito in about 1900, uh, the village was built away. So all of these houses, which are quite interesting and unique and well preserved, um, are dated back. Uh, I'll, let's say that's a very good preservation of an early 19th Ooh. century landscape. And this is, you know, one of the, one of the last sets of thatched houses. So this is one of the granite houses. And this is one of the lovely houses on uh, Balashir, which was still lived in um, until, I think it was the 1950s, Alistair Prochner, I've told you, maybe even the 60s. And you can still see bits of thatch uh, of its roof uh, um, left on the eaves there. And I managed to plot its several phases of development there, bottom right. And that's my book about the Thatched Houses of North Yost, which published in 2020. And then last year, well, we all know, because we took part in it, the Island of Stone survey, that's the map of everything we had to do. And uh, so we did all the preliminary survey work for them. A couple of interesting things we found when we were working there. Uh, this is up in the north end of North Yost. This very unusual um, <coughs> causeway leading to nowhere the dune that we were looking at is just around the corner there, but this just goes across this lock. There's a bit of an island in the middle and this very well built stone wall, which is obviously modern, cutting through it. And we wondered if this is the remains of another dune, which they'd raided the building to build this wonderful you know, modern stone wall. But you can see the condition of the causeway is quite extraordinary. You can just walk around the lock just here. So there's actually no reason to build a causeway there because it was just, it just took like, 50 yards off the walk route, so it didn't seem to be any point to it, apart from the fact it may have gone to another building. And this is another site that Roger found up in the northeast of the um, Kyle's Burnery Peninsula. This is when he and Trish found it, top right, when it was covered in bracken, but you could just see a few stones lying in the heather. And he and I went back last year and cleared all the heather away. And you can see what's probably another roundhouse um, and another. Uh, circular building attached to it and maybe a bit of a jetty or something. Can get a fold or who knows. And I'm just going to finish by talking a bit about Sculpe, uh, because we all know about the Sculpe um, uh, planning application. Roger and I have done a lot of survey work out here. And when the report was prepared, uh, which was published in December uh, last year, I was very disappointed with what they said about the archaeology. They rather wrote it all off. They didn't understand the history. Um, and um, they said they didn't think the spaceport proposal really affected it at all. Um, I was very disappointed about this because we knew a lot more about the history than certainly Gard, the archaeologist who did the work did. We knew, for instance, that the lock had been completely drained in about 1825. Um, we knew a lot about the farmhouse because some letters have been found um, which talked about it being built in about 1815. Now, Gard dated it to about 1830 and uh, Mary Harmon who was sat over there had also done quite a lot of survey work on this and I reproduced some drawings and we looked at some phasing and uh, Angus McMath who just sat here helped me sort out the order and what the rooms were and also what the internal layout probably was. He had been there uh, as a young man, but um, you, you can't put in anymore because it's locked up. So we presented all this information to Historic and Island Scotland. Angus also took me out to the tower, so we were able to go and have a look around this. You can see it's not in a very good state. There's one of the um, coin stones here from the, so one of the voussoirs rather, has slipped and has almost come out. There are big cracks right up through the building because the whole building is actually falling apart <coughs> outwards because of the way it was built. Um, it's not a folly, which everybody thinks it is. We know it was built by the McDonald's as a deer hunting kind of uh, pavilion. It had a first floor, it's got a fireplace in, it has a chimney, and uh, they had a road going to it because the lock has flooded since. So we put all this into Historic Environment Scotland saying, you need to really think about all this, um, but unfortunately nothing has happened, but anyway. Uh, Angus also found a lost uh, cut mark stone in the garden of the house which is shown there top right. He only found this a few months ago and um, just by clearing all that, I'd missed it completely because it was covered in grass and moss and everything, but um, that's been confirmed as being a 
cut mark stone. That's really interesting as well. I'm just going to skip over this now and just finish because we've run out of time. This is just a last visit that Roger and I made this year, just literally three or four months ago. We went to uh, this uh, fort out at Grote. Does anyone you can see it offshore from Cheese Bay? Um, we went out there in our dinghy and just spent a day looking at all these islands. We had a really interesting time. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it was, a, it was a fitting end to my field survey work. And I'm going to finish there. So, what did we achieve? Am I okay for time? Tell me if I would stop. Uh, three seconds, you've got three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not going to finish then. Any questions? <laughs> I have a really simple basic one. The lower of the island about the committee road and skull peg tower being follies and you know, the folly in the road being used to keep people from starvation, and that it was built by locals to keep them employed when there was famine and things like that. So, you're saying that's not accurate? No. What is the date difference? Uh, so and do you know how that started? The tower, there's a record of the tower being built. If you look hard enough, it was built by um, Dr. McLeod, who then lived at Ballalone House, because he actually owned that area of, you know, we think of it Skullpeg today, but it was actually uh, Kilfeda. And um, there's a record of it being built in about the mid 1820s, something like that, or 1830, something like that. This was probably before the serious starvation and clearances. And it was built as a project, not to give work to people. It was built, the McDonald's wanted somewhere where they could take their guests when they were deer hunting. And they said it had a carriage road out to it and all that kind of thing. So again, the, the, the sort of guesswork at what it might be, just because it looks like a folly, like other follies in Scotland, but it isn't one. And uh, yeah, so. Yeah. Are there any more questions in the room? And then we can go into Zoom and see if we have questions here. Do you know what's happened to all the birds? Uh, looks like it. They're still there, as far as I know. Yeah. No, okay. no, they've been removed, I think. Um, apparently, they're in storage in the regular club. Okay. That's a very good question. There are on North Ewers, there are about three or four places. This is not recently where they found what they think are boat rivets. So there's one near Loch Maddy. There's, I think there is probably there were some things found on an island near Foshgarry, back near Greenwich. Um, but nothing like what they found on South Ewers, unfortunately. Now, Roger and I did start looking for this stuff. We've been doing, this is one of the reasons we went out to that fort to see if we could sort of see any hints of Viking buildings. But although we think there's a possibility, um, we haven't really found anything. But there are, if you look in the records, there are just one or two on North Ewers, but there are many, much, much more on South Ewers. David, I'll ask if anybody in Zoom has any comments or questions, would you like to wave or put your camera on and give us a shout? Okay, Anne. Hi, David. Do you want to unmute? Uh, I, would, I, would just, you might be I would just muted. like to know who's going to carry on now that you're leaving. Oh, we mute so just you. adjusting our volume. Can you ask that again, please? I would just like to ask David who's going to carry on out there now that he's leaving. Uh, well, I know that Simon has done, done a lot more work on South East, um, Sheelings, and uh, this really interesting find they just made at Fulgonham on the shore. Sorry, I've lost your sound. Sorry. We're just getting it back. Should we okay now? Shall I try again? Um, Simon Davis, who sat in the room here, he will definitely continue. And Roger, too, I'm sure. So um, there are still I'll be over for two weeks next July. I'm happy to help. <laughs> okay. 
there any more questions in Zoom? Hey, can you hear me? Donald, yes, hello. Hi, hello. D just hello. wondering, David, one of the, obviously one of the oldest buildings around, and there's plenty of it left, is Trinity Temple. And presumably there'd be a village around the temple at the time servicing the place. Have you done anything there? Are you any thoughts on that? Well, in fact, one of the slides I skipped over was of a mound just next to Trinity Temple. And uh, yeah, and um, so Roger and I last year did a little bit of work on what we think are things, which are kind of assembly places that probably date back to Norse times. But we found these series of mounds that had uh, banks around them that didn't sort of seem to fulfill any, uh, should we say, livestock purpose. Um, and there is one, there is a platform uh, on a kind of mound just next door to Trinity Temple. So that's the only thing. We haven't done any work on the temple itself. You know, that's been well recorded anyway. But we found about five of these mounds uh, scattered around North East. And that was a piece of work we put in Discovery Excavation in Scotland last year, but haven't really done any more on it. This is in our sort of Viking quest um, that was one of the things that we thought might be connected to the Vikings, but again, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Any more questions in the room or in Zoom? <coughs> You've shared so much this evening. It's just phenomenal. <laughs> it's phenomenal. The amount of work that you've done with Simon and Roger. Um, but what can we say? I mean, it makes the rest of us look completely inadequate, but <laughs> I'm sure we'll, we'll up the game a bit, won't we, Anne? And, <laughs> and uh, the rest of the group, you've been totally inspiring. And it's been, you know, it's been brilliant being part of things with you. And thank you for all the contributions that you've made to UCAG, but also, I mean, generally with your publications, your entries to Canmore, um, just, just incredible, really, over quite a short period of time um, and we're going to miss you and we don't want you to leave but I know you're heading off um, to new adventures and do new things and no doubt uh, get involved in archaeology in other places maybe around Inverness where there's lots of amazing archaeology as well yes, yes, so but thank you so much and thank you for sharing your experiences with us this evening I and mean, it's been totally enlightening and inspiring and just wonderful and great to see all your your photograph so a huge yeah. thank yeah. you thank you very much we'll just finish with one thing and that is to say that there are copies of all of the reports from the library at Linaclet but also I will send you uh, links uh, tomorrow so people if want people want a PDF copy of any of these reports they can download them and there'll be link, download links and I'll send those to you to you can share tomorrow. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you very much for coming to Linaclet. And thank you very much for joining us in Zoom. And apologies again for the delay at the beginning, but um, it was a fantastic evening and I hope you've all enjoyed yourself and we will see you soon. I'm not sure what's coming up next, but uh, <laughs> will be something soon, I think. Anyway, thank you ever so much. Take care. Night, night, everybody. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.